Wives take their lamps with extra flasks of oil. Now what's cool about this uh, parable is there is a large discrepancy between the two groups of women, but there are actually more similarities than differences. And I think that's important when we think about the church, when we think about those who call themselves Christian. There may be more similarities on the surface than the one discrepancy in the heart. So first, we see the same similarity that all of them had been invited to the banquet. We know that God has invited the whole world to come to heaven with him, right? He wants everyone to be a part of his family. And the Bible even says he's delaying, he's tarrying, so that more will be saved before he returns. Second, all of them answered the invitation, right? So they all go to meet the bridegroom. All of them are intrigued. All of them are excited to have been invited. Uh, there are many who see the invitation today from Jesus and don't want anything to do with it, right? So these ladies are a bit different. Many people see the invitation and throw it in the trash, as maybe you've done with some invitations in your life. I don't know. But uh, that's what many people do today, right? They see the invitation and they discard it. Well, none of these ladies did. All ten of them answered that call. But five of them are still foolish. So as we dig through it, we start to see some cool uh, differences, though. So like the parable of the great banquet in Luke 14, people give excuses, I have to tend to this, I have to tend to that, I can't come to your banquet. Um, but the last similarity here is that all of them become drowsy and fall asleep. And many uh, can, when I first looked at this passage, I saw that as potentially a negative. Excuse me, that all of them had fallen asleep. But this, this actually isn't the negative part. We're going to see the negative part in a second. I think the fact that they all fell asleep because the bridegroom came at midnight, it's understandable to be sleeping at midnight, maybe not for some of you, <laughs> some of us, but for, for these women, it was understandable for them to be asleep at midnight, right? So we may be working, eating, sleeping, pursuing leisure activities, whatever it is, we must be doing it in a way that we don't have to make things right or go get more oil when Jesus comes. So the sleeping in this passage, it should not be interpreted as a negative. When we see some of these parables, I think we like to think that everything is a symbol of everything, and we need to find out what sleep means, and we need to find out what oil means, and we need to find out what banquet means, all these different things. I think that this, in this uh, context, is simply saying that they were going about, they were, they were going about their sleeping time, uh, and that their falling asleep was not a negative. We'll see the negative soon. So, in verse 6, that's the next one, we see the main difference emerge as this cry rings out at midnight, Right? It wakes all of them up. They're going, okay, what's going on? And it says, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet the bridegroom. And this is revealing either the panic to rejoice, or the, excuse me, the reason to rejoice, or the reason to panic, right? And this is the climax of the story, because in our Western brains, we like to think that the climax of the story is going to be at the end. But in the Hebrew mind, this climax is right here at the center. Here's the bridegroom. Come to meet him. This is what this story is centered around. So just as there was a cry that woke these women, there will also be a cry from heaven when Jesus returns to wake us up too, if we're sleeping, or to get our attention if we're not. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So just as there's a cry in this passage saying, hey, he's back, well, there's going to be a loud noise one day too, and we'll be see if we are privileged to be a part of that here or not. So this cry is really what reveals the five foolish from the five wise. Because what does it show? Am I ready or not for this? Was I prepared for this? Five are and five are not. The five women without oil are clearly the ones who are not prepared, right? But these women do not seem to be angry, wicked, sinful individuals. They don't seem to be atheists who hate God. They don't seem to be people who oppose Jesus. They seem like the other women, but they don't have any extra oil. Maybe these are good church people. Maybe these are people who have answered the invitation uh, to come to Jesus, and they've shown lots of interest. They've answered it. They've attended. They have a Christian background. They have a Christian uh, covering on them. They're hardly different in this story from the five women with oil, but they're not truly ready because they have not been born again. Now, some of you may disagree with me on some of this, and that is okay. Uh, the Holy Spirit is symbolized by oil in many places throughout Scripture. So I think in this passage that it can be tempting to try to make that same connection here 
um, with the, the oil in this passage being the Holy Spirit. I think that that's tempting. And if that's where you land, that's fine. Um, I don't see direct context supporting that, though, that the five foolish have run out and need more and that the five wise had brought extra with them. So if you're going to say that, these, that the Holy Spirit is the symbol of the oil here, you would also have to say that the five wise had brought extra of the Holy Spirit with them. That could potentially have been given away. Um, and that the five foolish had brought some of him with them and that they had run out. Um, if you're a believer here today, you're not running out of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I had a long chat with Ken about this the other day, actually, and it's kind of a coincidence. You're not going to run out of him if you need extra motivation, extra inspiration, extra experiences with the Holy Spirit that deepen your relationship with God, and that kind of fills you back up with this motivation and energy to take on the Christian life, that's one thing. But to consider that you could run out of the fullness of the Holy Spirit is another story. I believe the plain reading of the text here is oil is a symbol of inward preparation for the coming of Christ. It's an inward preparation. Five of them have it, and five of them don't. So the panic sets in for these foolish ladies in verse 8 as they plead with the wise, hey, give us some of your oil. He's coming. You can, you can start to sense some of the panic and start to feel that yourself when you think about maybe when you weren't a Christian and then you became saved and you thought, how scary would it have been for me if this had not happened to me? How scared would I have been when Jesus returned? How scared would I have been if I was going to uh, find out that my time had, had run up? We can think about those things when our eyes are opened, and then we can start to feel some of the despair that's sinking in for these ladies who are a symbol of all of the unbelievers that you and I know in our lives today. Um, that's who they're representing. Uh, so they plead with some of their oil. Unfortunately, there's not enough for everybody. And I think a lesson here is that you are not going to be saved by the faith of another person. And I think a lot of people fall into that camp in our families and stuff. They say, well, my parents raised me in a Christian home. My wife, my husband has always been a faithful churchgoer. They've always been a Christian influence on me. But the question from Jesus is, where is your heart? Not where is your wife's heart. Not, where, not what type of home were you raised in. Where is your heart? Where do you stand in your relationship with me? The extra oil that the five wise virgins had brought with them was of no benefit to the five foolish virgins. They could not borrow it. They could not bank on somebody else bailing them out at the last moment. Each of us carries our own torch with our own oil, and God is ultimately going to hold us accountable for that. So the preparation of faithful Christians, like us hopefully today, is not benefit to the unsaved when Jesus will return. So what do they tell them? They say, well, you guys can head into town and buy your own. We're heading to meet the bridegroom. We have somewhere to be. Uh, but this is actually the moment of doom for these foolish virgins as the ready, the people that were prepared, enter into the wedding feast with the bridegroom. The door is permanently shut. All hope is lost for them at this point, and they are going to experience true despair. Now, we can all think of times where we felt real despair in our lives. Maybe your parents left the restaurant without you when you were a kid, or um, you really felt like you were getting left behind somewhere, and some parents may know that they've done that to their kids too, but um, for me, there was this story, um, I was 11 or 12, and I was waiting at the bus stop with my sister, and it was our first day ever on the bus, it was our first, we never rode the bus, mom and dad always took us to school, or we were homeschooled before, but it was our first day ever riding the bus, and we were at this bus stop that we had never been to, and my mom left us there, and um, there's a car next to us, and it has a lady and her son in the car. And the bus comes down the road, we can see it, and my sister and I were like 11. We're like, all right, let's get on the bus. And um, it just blows right by us. And it stops like 200 yards up the street at a different stop sign. And so we kind of look at each other, and my sister, being the leader, she's like, we have to run, we have to run. And so it's 6.30 in the morning, and we're just like sprinting down this dark, cold road, and the lady in her car next to us just drove, just blew right by us and to take her son to the bus stop. And so my sister and I are like, well, she could have helped us out, you know. Um, but we finally make it up to the bus, and so we're just, it's so funny looking back at it. Have you ever tried to run with a backpack on? That's not a very easy task either. Um, but the lady in the car, she doesn't care. She zips right by. She's got her own places to be. And we're looking at the doors on the run, and we're like, don't close. Because once you see those bus doors close, they're leaving. You know? they're, not, they're not waiting for you. So 
We're like, don't close, don't close, because then we'd have to run all the way back home. Don't close, and we make it in time, realizing that somebody had messed up and put us at the wrong bus stop, namely my parents. Um, but we had made it onto the bus in time. So even though we had made a mistake, made a mistake, even though we had, uh, you know, been put in a tough position, the doors were still open for us, and we. At the end of the day, we really did belong on that bus. We had to put in a little bit of work to get there, but we did belong on the bus. And uh, it was last minute, but we made it. So many people think that they do have this rightful spot in God's kingdom, but they simply don't. Uh, we knew that was our bus, and we're going to get on the bus. And some people think that they have that spot, but they don't. And the doors are not going to be opened when they run up to him, when the doors are closed. See, the doors of the bus were still open for us, thank God, because that was a sign that we could still, still get on. But the doors um, that we see at the end of this parable will not be opened again. So the, fur the foolish virgins return with their oil in verse 11, and they start begging for the doors to be open to them. And this is where we can kind of relate a little bit with that panic again, with that just hopelessness and despair. And it should make us, it should soften our hearts and what does Jesus say to them? What does the bridegroom say to them? Truly I say to you, I do not know you. That's going to be a hard thing for many people to hear. Truly I do not know you, or I never knew you. But God knowing his chosen people is an affirmation to you and I today that, uh, he really, that we really do belong to him. Knowing, knowing God means that you belong to him. In Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Um, Hosea, when God is talking to his people, he says, it was you who I knew in the wilderness. I knew you guys in the wilderness. And this statement in Matthew 25 is similar to Matthew 7. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons, do many mighty works, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Matthew 27, the five foolish 25, the five foolish virgins. And Matthew 7, these people who think that they belong in heaven, seem quite similar. They weren't that different from the five foolish virgins other than that they were unprepared. But they all seem to have a similarity that they think they belong in that banquet. They think they belong in that wedding celebration. So why is it that Jesus says he ne actually never knew these people because in both Matthew 7 and Matthew 25, both groups of people truly thought that Jesus did know them. They were under every assumption that they were right where they needed to be in their relationship with Christ. But they were told actually that they were evil and workers of lawlessness in Matthew 7. I think this is important to catch, and I think this is one of the main messages of this parable, is that the virgins of Matthew 25 are not angry atheists, they're not Satanists, they're not in, the, in a cult, they're not... They're not angry with God. These are people who had fully believed they had a right to enter heaven, yet were shocked by the news that they were never actually made righteous through faith. And that's going to be this situation for a lot of people, and often some of the hardest people to reach that believe that they're fine because they have a Christian uh, uh, background. You know? Jesus ends this parable with the counsel to watch because we do not know the day or the hour when he will come. Verse 13, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, this parable does contain some grim warnings about hopelessness that are going to happen once the door is shut. But those who are prepared have everlasting joy set before them. So it's not just a parable of hard warnings and bad news. Uh, those with oil in their lamps can heed Christ's warning to watch for his coming with a hopeful anticipation instead of uh, lukewarm apathy. Prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 33, this is a great one, Yet in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited by neither people nor animals, there will be heard once more the sounds of joy and gladness and the voices of the bride and bridegroom. And I think that's so cool. To, all the way back in Jeremiah, he was saying, God is going to restore the joy of this wedding celebration when he comes to meet his bride. Yeah. So Jesus has restored this joy. He's going to restore this joy as well. Uh, and the celebration of the bride and the bridegroom. And that is the joy found between us and Christ. So how is it that we can enter in with the bridegroom before the door is shut? Because God is fulfilling his promise, has brought us salvation through Jesus Christ, 
And all of that joy, all of that gladness comes along with it as Jeremiah had prophesied. You and I do not uh, trust in our own abilities and good works to feel prepared. So if you feel unprepared here, the idea isn't that you try really hard and do a bunch of good stuff to impress God, and do a bunch of good stuff to impress God to feel prepared. It's that you embrace more of him and more of his salvation, or experience his salvation for the first time if that is necessary. So this personal, powerful teaching from Jesus to his disciples is full of hard truths, but it is also hopeful. So Jesus goes on for 93 verses here from the beginning of the disciples' questions to the end about all the different warnings about false prophets, signs of the end days, persecuting of the church, punishment of the wicked. But Jesus ends it with this, the very last line of this whole sentence before they head away to go to Passover. Jesus says, These will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That's how he wraps it up. He says, You know what? The righteous will go to eternal life. So the surrender of a life to Christ can definitely be done with the mindset of wanting to avoid punishment. But I think that real abundant life in Christ not, comes not through just focusing on avoiding punishment, but through embracing eternal life and embracing Jesus for who he is and what he has done. I believe that opens a door that when that door is opened, uh, I want to embrace more of God, more of his salvation, then God is able to come so powerfully through that door. And like Paul says in Ephesians that he's able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, but that it is according to his power at work within us. So if you're a Christian today and you feel unprepared in a way, not that you don't know that you're saved, but you feel unprepared, well, it's time to embrace more of that uh, eternal life and more of, of God's uh, changing power that he wants to continue to do in our sanctification. So in closing, um, Mike? And Dorothy and Sharon, do you want to come up here, please? I believe it is fair that uh, it's fair to say there's further preparation that's being asked of all of us today. All of us have more preparation to do. And it looks different, and I don't exactly know how I would prescribe that to different people. What is the preparation you need to do in your life for Jesus to come back? What does that look like? I don't really know. And in my own life, I can think of a few things. But maybe for some of us, it's just having some of those conversations that we need to have with people. It's letting go of that sin. It's working through that issue that God's been wanting us to work through, to feel more prepared for when he comes. Extra oil. God is calling us all to bring extra oil with us on our journey, I think. And I think maybe you may be the only one who knows what that is. It's not bringing extra of the Holy Spirit with you. He's with you. I think it's bringing along more knowledge, more wisdom, a deeper relationship with God that helps you solidify that you are truly prepared. Many of us are prepared for lots of things. You could have a cellar loaded with food and jars, and you've been canning for years. And some of us here probably have some ammo loaded up, prepared for whatever you might need in the coming days with food and different things like that. But what about our hearts? What preparation needs to get done in our hearts? I would hate to have, be so prepared for hard times, but unprepared in my heart. Um, I think that that's important. Revelation 19.7 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. The bride makes herself ready. And we are able, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to make ourselves ready. The last hymn lyric I'll throw at you here says, When the trump of God shall sound, can you come into his presence unafraid? Can you wait with a joyful heart while the Master reads the record you have made? And you wait with a joyful heart. And I was just talking with Martha this week about some of this stuff about when Jesus returns, can it be possible for the Christian to you know, be embarrassed? Be unprepared? At the end of the day, you are prepared because you have the Holy Spirit and God has redeemed you and he will never take that away from you. But could you be unprepared? And I don't know if I have all the answers to that. I think you can in a way, but God's never going to 
abandon you because of a lack of preparation in that way as a Christian. But even if we don't have the answer to that, the answer is to be as prepared as you can. And to think about the people in your life that aren't. And to think about the things in your life that God is asking you to move on from. And I think all of us can consider that today. So Mike, if you want to play a little bit, I can, uh, I'll pray and we can all just meditate on some of the stuff that we've heard. Lord, uh, we know you're coming at a day. Um, we don't know the hour or the moment. But we ask that as we consider the difference between the five foolish virgins and the five wise, that we would see that there is a way to be fully prepared, ultimately through relationship with you. And the extra preparation after that seems to be, Father, further holiness and sanctification through your Spirit. So we ask that each of us would experience just uh, extra measures of that, Lord, always, to see the great things you have for us to do and the great places you have for us to go. Grow us together as a church. We can be prepared individually, but we also want to be prepared as a church. Many times we can find ourselves uh, talking and elaborating about how bad the world is getting, but what if it would be a shame if we see that and don't become more prepared for what is coming. Uh, so help us be prepared, not just with food or whatever else we feel like we need to prepare for, uh, but to be prepared in our hearts for your coming, Lord. And we don't know when it's going to be, but we know that just as the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps and had extra oil, that we can be prepared that way as well. Uh, please bless us as we worship here, as we close out. Sing about your coming, Lord. A great song to finish something like this, Father. Bless us with the preparation we need to go out and bless the world around us, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, please stand, everybody. Let's sing one more song. Very fitting song that Mike always wants me to play. <laughs>
that, whether it's a relationship you need to mend, a conversation you need to have, a sin you need to let go of, a vital verse you need to read, whatever it is. Um, keep growing and keep getting prepared. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.